I hate it here. And yet, I won't get off this ride. They've made it clear. Success is not their modus operandi. I'll shed no tears as I've embraced this team with eyes wide. And though I may only be here so I won't get fined, I'd like to welcome you all to another episode of IG 50i. You would think that being days removed from that L the Chargers took to the Ravens that I would have had time to kind of sift through my feelings and get over it, move on to this Patriots matchup, which is just a mere few days away because that should be the focus. But nah, no, 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 no. That loss really sticks in my craw. It's stewing in your boy's soul. And why is that? Well, it's because the Chargers did what the Chargers do. And in a matchup where I fully expected them to get their teeth kicked in against the Ravens, what do you know? They compete pretty much throughout the entirety of the game, keep it close, and naturally they chatter by themselves a few times and lose because of it. But even greater than that, Sunday night football matchup, which means all of America's watching because it's the only show in town. And all you've been hearing about is how horrible the Chargers defense is and how terrible Brandon Staley is as a play caller. And what do you know? Old Brando makes a couple of personnel adjustments and uh, defense plays a very good game. And the offense wets the bed, which means that's right. Fuel is added to the Justin Herbert narrative. Gotta love it. But anyway, I digress. Let's get into number one, shall we? Uh, I'm going to call this one a box of rocks. As for some completely unwarranted reason, Chargers Brass seems to fancy themselves uh, the smartest guys in the room. I mean, there's just this real air of arrogance that really, really pisses me off. I mean, let's start with John Spanos, you know. As I like to call him, the puppet master, the dude behind the curtain, pulling the strings uh, on the Pinocchio to his Geppetto, Tom Telesco, who, when he isn't meandering about picking up John's Starbucks and dry cleaning, I guess is canoodling with Brandon Staley, you know, doing his middleman thing and good old Brando. Genius, right? Guy who's calling Carter's defense and yet he sucks at calling it. Strange, I can't quite figure out how that works, but keep doing your thing, Brandon. Uh, they just made all these ridiculous decisions. I mean, we don't have to get into great detail. Let's just throw out some names here. Got those wonderful third round selections and Trey Pipkins. How's that uh, new deal working out? Looks good, doesn't he? Cool. And then you've got uh, Trey McKitty, who's probably somewhere delivering Domino's Pizza right now. Maybe we should stay away from guys named Trey. Just thought. I don't know. Seems like a trap. <sighs> These decisions just seem to not be panning out. And then to the most recent one, when uh, the Chargers had literally every opportunity not to miss on a difference-making wide receiver, they took a project wide receiver who's not great at separation, who had one of the worst drop rates in college football last year, and um, is a bigger body guy, which fits their profile. You know, that's right up their alley. But he hit a late growth spurt, modeled his game when he was younger after smaller wide receivers and plays like a smaller wide receiver. So literally doesn't match. It's like the movie Big. Remember that Tom Hanks? Super strange. Um, And yet they felt like that was the best way to go. And then they're asking him to do the things that he was terrible at in college. And I don't know, maybe seem a little surprised that he's not succeeding. Well, I wonder why. Come on, smart guys. Y'all can figure it out. I mean, you had to know this could possibly be an issue, right? Thought you had it all figured out. 
clearly the math wasn't mathing. And now you found yourself in a situation where you have one viable threat at the wide receiver position because, of course, you're dealing with multiple issues with injuries, but you tempted fate. And now you're paying the price for it. Went into the season with uh, number one wide receiver who's 31 years old and albeit is having an all pro year. Shout out to Slay, KA13, doing your thing, helping to carry this offense. So nothing but respect to that man. Uh, but last season, missed a chunk of games due to a soft tissue injury, hamstring problem. Uh, this season, you're without your number two wide receiver, Mike Williams, who has an extensive extensive injury history dating all the way back to his days uh, at Clemson. Your number three guy, Josh Palmer, got nicked up a bit last season and has missed four games this year. Not even sure when he's going to be back. And what did that do? Further expose your rookie first round draft pick who still isn't ready to go. But you know what? I'm sure you guys will figure it out. I mean, between Doogie Hauser, uh, Young Sheldon and uh, Jimmy Neutron. Y'all got this handle. I'm sure of it, right? This is going to keep the hits going and uh, roll right into number two. I think I'm going to call this one Stranger Than Fiction. And I'm kind of sort of going to piggyback off of that wide receiver conversation we were having in number one. Because I, uh, I think some of your ire is misdirected when it comes to certain people and the roles that they play in personnel decisions. <laughs> Case in point, the Chargers whole archetype where it comes to wide receivers, like the bigger body guys, this was a thing that existed prior to Tom Telesco. You've got your Vincent Jacksons, your Malcolm Floyds, you're familiar, right? Well, then ask yourself, where did Tom Telesco's philosophy on players come from? Well, Tom is of the Bill Polian tree. He spent somewhere I think what from 98 to about 2012 before he's with the Chargers with the Colts organization and he idolized Bill Polian now go back and look at some of the best wide receivers for the Colts and what they kind of lean towards with regards to the type of dudes that they drafted and picked up uh, you've got Hall of Famers Marvin Harrison got your Reggie Wayne then cats like uh, Brandon Stokely and T.Y. Hilton and you notice all these dudes, or oh, Pierre Garçon, don't want to forget about Peter Waiter. There's something that all these cats had in common. I don't think any one of them were taller than about six feet. All guys whose abilities ranged from good to elite when it came to route running, hands, and speed. So my question is... Why would Tom's philosophy on that particular position group change once he got to the Chargers? Doesn't quite make sense to me. Just a little something to make you go, hmm. And I will tell you what, man, this whole Justin Herbert discourse thing has gotten completely out of control. We can virtually talk about it every week and uh, have something new to discuss. Or really, not necessarily something new because the stories are all redundant, but they point at new things every week. And this whole narrative behind the Justin Herbert has multiple weapons thing, so he should be more successful, is just completely and totally a farce. Are you all paying attention out there? Talked about it a little bit in number two. He's down his number two and number three wide receiver, and his rookie wide out isn't apparently ready to play professional football quite yet. His uh, running back is aging by the snap, and they have no plans to utilize the fourth uh, round draft pick that they used on a running back last season. So I'm not sure exactly what you expect them to do. Throw the ball, catch it, run it like all of the above. Is he supposed to block for himself also? Just curious about how this works. Uh, as far as margin for error is concerned, I would say he's mostly granted very little by the general public. People just expect him to be perfection, and that's literally what he has to be and how he has to perform in order for the team just to compete. Really think about that. He's been the team's leading rusher for the last two weeks. Uh, Why? Why does that have to be the case? It's because everything that surrounds him isn't 
as glitzy and glamorous as everyone paints it out to be, which is why some of these names that you see surrounding him won't be there going into next year. And I know it all kind of sort of depends on who the next coach will be and what their philosophy is. But still, some of these names kind of have to go. Uh, some of it has to be for cap reasons, and I'm sure some of it has to do with whether or not they actually fit the direction of the team moving forward. And since we're talking about cap, and in this instance, I'm using the uh, version of the word that is defined as lying. There is another term that's being thrown around loosely in reference to Justin Herbert. Word that's been repurposed to mean something that doesn't quite align with what I would describe him as. Uh, people are saying he's mid. Now, from my recollection, that word was always more so associated with like weed smokers. And it was how they described like a grade of weed. Uh, I don't smoke, so uh, if I'm wrong here, uh, forgive me. But mid was another way to uh, reference like average weed or what was also known as Reggie, if I'm not mistaken. So tell me how mid all of this sounds. Just interested to get your take on it through what a little more than three and a half years in his career or into his career he's got a few records you know uh let's walk through them shall we most passing touchdowns by a rookie quarterback most total touchdowns by a rookie qb most 300 yard passing games by a rookie qb most completions by a rookie quarterback most games with at least three touchdown passes by a rookie most passing yards in a quarterback's first two seasons most total touchdowns in a quarterback's first two seasons first quarterback to record 30 touchdown passes in each of his first two seasons most passing yards in a quarterback's first three nfl seasons most completions in first 50 nfl games most attempts per game most completions per game and finally last but not least most consecutive seasons of 4,000 passing yards to begin a career super mid yeah i know um but then there's also the fact that the gentleman is 20 and 5 and we're talking one loss record when his defense yields less than 28 points now imagine expecting your defense to consistently give up less than 30 points it's it's a novel concept but apparently uh it's asking for too much where justin herbert is concerned and then there's the whole not clutch narrative which is strange because you know Guy has 11 fourth quarter comebacks and 14 game winning drives, which also coincidentally happens to be the most of any QB since 2020. I'm not sure what kind of math you guys are doing out there. It's just all, all very interesting. On top of that, there's also a conversation that seems to all happen almost weekly. Probably goes a little something like this. Like, hey, Justin, um, I know you just put us ahead with like four or so minutes left to go. And you only have like two capable offensive weapons and an underachieving offensive line. But the defense just crapped itself and gave the lead right back. So would you mind going out there and doing that all over again? Hmm. But again, you guys hold all the top level QBs to these standards. And they have to figure out how to navigate around all these similar issues that this gentleman does so you're clearly not biased you clearly don't have an agenda it's just me i am imagining all these things it's the only logical explanation another really popular conversation that's got twitter ablaze and national media charges fans and even folks that have absolutely no idea about this organization they just want to have something to say is what the team's next steps are going to be where uh leadership in the front office and coaching is concerned and i get asked this a lot and if you talk to me regularly you already know what my opinion is but i will lay it out here just in case you are not familiar familiar with me and my stance i'm going to call number four uh by the way no change without change my opinion has been for quite some time that the Chargers need an alpha as a head coach. Someone who's established, who has some experience. No more novice guys. No more first-year head coaches. Like, 
throw that out of the window. It doesn't work. It's time to do something different. And that's why I push all my chips in on Jim Harbaugh. Probably be available this offseason. And uh, I know you've been paying attention to all of the things that have been going on surrounding that Michigan program. And I'm not so sure that John wants to be around for much more of that. Sorry, Jim. I always do that with their names. But anyway, can you imagine what happens if Jim wins a natty with all that's going on in Ann Arbor? And gets to ride off into the sunset, back into the NFL. That'd be a storyline. Likelihood is pretty high, I think, actually. But anyway, back to the point. Jim coaches a brand of football that the Chargers sorely lack in. It's physicality. Um, He is going to establish a run game. The trenches on both sides of the ball will be an emphasis Um, you're going to have disciplined guys on the offensive and defensive side of the ball and he's going to hold players accountable dudes ain't going to play just because they have names if they aren't producing it's going to be some consequences jim can be a little bit of a curmudgeon he wears on people and teams and that's why he tends to not stick around in places for very long even though this michigan tenure has been uh, somewhat lengthy but it's also his alma mater so it makes sense he is exactly what the Chargers need now when you're talking about a GM well I'm one that believes that the Chargers won't really go outside of the organization to find their next guy because Telesco's probably also done I could absolutely see them promoting a guy like Jojo wouldn't just kind of make sense. He's one of their long ter- uh, term guys. And uh, I mean, I guess if you ask around, he's probably earned it. But there would 1000 percent need to be a buffer between Jim Harbaugh and uh, John Spanos. Oh, boy. I can imagine what those conversations would look like. You want to talk about an actual football guy who knows the game in and out, sitting down in front of John Spanos and John attempting to uh, assert his will and his knowledge about the game and what he thinks worked, man, Jim would emasculate that man in about five minutes. I would love to be a fly on the wall. But anyway, yeah, that is pretty much my opinion. Uh, For me, it's Jim Harbaugh bust. Will it work out? I don't know, but I think the Chargers stand a very good chance at getting him. Um, We're talking about having a young quarterback like Justin Herbert. I think Harbaugh would work wonders for that kid. And making sure that he has all the requisite weapons and uh, guys that are playing not just to the scheme but are also fundamentally sound surrounding him so want to know my thoughts there they are Jim's my guy that's all there is to it yeah generally a big name coach like Jim Harbaugh would be a pie in the sky concept for the Chargers because we know that's not what they really do But I have this inkling this time around that Dean may want to go in a different direction. Going to call number five uh, motivation via mockery. The Bolts have garnered some not so great press lately. I would venture to say that there's a level of embarrassment that comes along with being a fan of the team. I know I personally feel it. I can't speak for the rest of you guys out there. But the flip side to this is. I think it may cause uh, Dean to have a little bit of a change of heart. If not for anything but to save face and uh, protect his ego. Because, you know, millionaire, billionaire owners probably think relatively highly of themselves and care how other people view them. And Dino is no longer in San Diego. No, no, no. He's uh, in the big leagues now. Your team resides in the second largest media market in the country. So you're going to have eyes on you all the time. And when things go wrong, people are going to talk about it, as you are seeing lately. And being the laughing stock of the NFL, I mean, to the point to where you're going on TV and listening to people literally bag on the Chargers and their head coach. In a way that I'm not sure I've ever seen, like Staley gets dunked on on multiple shows in 
various segments by your who's who of media personalities. I got to imagine that Dean's sitting at the crib just kind of doing it and just really not having a great go. And probably feeling like he has to do things uh, a tad bit differently than what he has in years past. And Dean, I, I agree, sir. If for no other reason, go ahead and protect that ego, man. Do what you got to do. Um, if we benefit from getting a better team because of it, all good. I care less about how you feel personally, but if that is your motivation, then by all means, make it happen. And I also, you know, allude to or have alluded to the fact that the Chargers have done a few things here differently in the last few years than what you're accustomed to them doing. Going after some of the bigger name free agents, taking shots at players that you would have never imagined them uh, acquiring. The J.C. Jackson thing, 1000% blew up in their face. But mm, three, four years ago, if someone would have told you the Chargers would consider a player like that with a little bit of a spotty background, you know good and well that would have been a no-go. And just entertaining that conversation would have been a waste of your time. And you clearly would have been talking to someone who had no idea of how the team operates. But it looks like it might be a new day. And all we can do is keep our fingers crossed. So... With all of that out of the way, guess we need to talk a little bit about the fact that the Chargers are going up against a two-win team in the New England Patriots, which, you know, generally would make you feel pretty good about walking away with a W, but this is the Chargers we're talking about, and it's also the Patriots who almost always have the Chargers number. This time around, there's a QB problem. So that works in the Chargers' favor. But mm, we don't want to uh, cash our chips in just yet, right? Let's take it easy. Pump the brakes. Because here's what I feel about the scenario. Chargers win this game. They were expected to win. I mean, the Patriots aren't very good. Regardless as to whether Bill Belichick is their head coach or not, the dude can only work but so much magic. And as you've seen... Team suffered all season long, whether it's from his old school ways uh, going about coaching. You could argue he might have ruined at least one quarterback. I mean, look, Mac Jones was not good coming out of Alabama. I didn't think so. People hyped him up, made him a thing, and mm, we see where he is now. But uh, whew, doesn't seem like Bill is having that great of a time developing him. He nor his staff seem to be having the impact that you would expect them to, but that coaching staff is kind of up in flux. I mean, you got just anybody coaching any position, and there are certain uh, coordinator roles that aren't really even filled with, like, coordinators, technically. And just all over the place, and it feels like Bill has his hand in a little bit of everything. And then on top of that, he is definitely not great at constructing a roster. So I know a lot of people out there have heard his name in the mix for potential replacement for Brandon Staley, but I'm going to be honest with you, I don't want any parts of Bill. What has the Patriot way gotten him since Tom Brady left? I will say this, though. The prospects of the Chargers potentially losing to this New England team does intrigue me in this way. You telling me they're going to hold on to Brandon Staley after a loss to that squad? If you want to nuke your fan base, that's the way to do it. How are you going to sell them on that for the remainder of the year? I mean, you're already walking the plank. But, I mean, how do you get behind a coach, push that coach, and even have the team believe in that guy if you can't get a win against this team? Guess we'll have to wait and see, but that's it for me, folks. You know what it is. I appreciate you for coming through because you don't have to spend time listening to me rant, but you do, and it is much appreciated. And I will see you on After Hours Sunday, my guys, Jamie and Garrett, regardless as to whether the Chargers win or lose. But if they, in fact, do the latter, it will be what? Colorful. Y'all take it easy. Go. On.